happening and, and, and continue to happen. So the violence is just so devastating, and I'm just really uh, trying to compose myself because I'm just really, like, literally feel very uh, vulnerable right now. I'm just in so much pain. I'm just like, sometimes I feel that, you know, where do I want to go? What is my place in this movement for for the for right. the fight for the communities? It's it's extremely extremely difficult. So I hope your listeners challenge. You know, I challenge them to really listen first and foremost. Right, listen instead of shutting us down, and then have a difficult conversation. And then say, how can we all come together and end this abuse and violence that is happening? to the LGBT community, but it's specifically transgender woman of color. Yes, and and I've uh, done the research. It looks like you had received quite a bit of media coverage for speaking out and trying to speak to the president at the event. I want to quote, this is from Slate.com. This is from last June, so literally this is almost a year ago. So it says, the debate over the incident has settled into somewhat predictable camps those who feel that Gutierrez violated basic decorum in an unproductive way and those who view her decision to take an advantage of a rare encounter with the president as a righteous move. So right there, even this article in Slate is saying that some members of the community are like, yeah, absolutely, that was right for you to speak up. And others are like, shh, be silent now. You know, so mm-hmm. is that has that been your reaction in the last year? I mean, have a lot of people talked to you about, about the incident at the White House? Yeah, it, it has been um, um, broadly discussed within our communities. And to me, that is unfortunate that we really spend so much energy, so much time in the tactic, the way it was delivered. Because here I'm talking about serious issues and issues that are, it could be the life and death for many of us, right? right? And um, again, let me let me remind my community that Sylvia Rivera, when she stormed on this LGBTQ Pride event in New York City in 1969, she really took over the mic and, and, and was saying, you know, what's happening to our um, brothers and sisters in, in jail? Have you ever been bitten? Have you ever been raped? Right, so this is the violence that, that we are facing. So to me, those are the serious issues that we need to discuss. And know how it was handled or, or delivered, right? Because to me, that does a disservice, and, and it only attacks my credibility. I do want to highlight though that this wasn't like an oh, oh now all of a sudden this becomes an issue. Whether I had been successfully um, uh, carry out this this protest there was a community already working so it, it it eventually it was going to be hurt right it was going to be at the time yeah. where the community had to really have this conversation but just doing that interruption it really created and forced to have these conversations and i've been fortunate to be able to travel to different colleges throughout the u.s and continue to have these very conversations we are having instead of Oh, but that wasn't the right moment. That wasn't the right way. Or, oh, yes, you did. You know, it was. It, 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 here, it, it's a broader issue that is impacting so many of us. Right. So, I want to. I want to ask you some questions about the, the trans community as a whole, because when we look at our LGBTQ organizations, uh, I call them kind of like the top four, or the top five that speak for us when it comes to you know, their public outreach and advocacy, and they're the ones that hold the news conferences when we have a major event. So in the recent months since the Supreme Court decision with all of these state-by-state bills, you know, the anti-trans bathroom bill in North Carolina, that sort of thing, it seems mm-hmm. like all of the pub- public attention and focus involving the word trans has been about those bills. Does that Does that make you feel still a little bit marginalized? Like, they're only seeing one small slice of the trans pie, like they're putting that on blast, but they're not seeing the big picture? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 really um unfortunate that we just single out on, on one specific um uh, you know issue or or i guess having access to public facilities and then it kind of to me is a distraction for the bigger problems that we face as a community right like for instance the lack of access to employment the the lack of access 
to uh, health care or, or hormonal treatment for those of us who need to, to you know, or want access to them. The, the housing is such a huge issue, and especially the youth that are being really hit hard. And, and ever since we've been doing the work around immigrant detention facility, like literally our home has become like a shelter for many of our, our sisters who have been detained for months or years, right? So here we're dealing with so many other bigger issues. Like for those of us in the transgender community who are fortunate enough to have a job, some are losing their jobs because they want to transition and because, you know, the, it cannot be the right image for the company. Either you're making customers uncomfortable or, or whatever kind of environment you're doing. So to me, it's just like having these conversations, it really challenges the stigma. And at the end, hopefully, it's my, under, my, my really hope that people can get past through what's between our legs, can get passed through uh, who are we sleeping with behind closed doors, right? And then say that we are just like anyone in this earth trying to fulfill our dreams, having to be really productive in society. But the reality is that the barriers and the challenges that we face make it extremely difficult. And that's why this anti-trans legislation, to me, is, is a step backwards. And, and we need to move forward as a community. We need to move forward as a nation. Yes. <clears throat> Agreed. And, and on June 26th, of course, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary of the quote-unquote, you know, historic decision from the Supreme Court. Um, Jim said, I want to ask you about the election. We've been in such a contentious and historic election year this year, you know, on the Republican side. We started off with 17 candidates. Um, television celebrity and host uh, Donald Trump knocked them all out one by one in an uh, amazingly, you know, negative campaign of hateful rhetoric hate speech has been uh, locked by Mr. Trump in almost every group possible. I, I do want to give you the chance to comment on what is your take on Donald Trump, the candidate, and would Donald Trump, the president, frighten you? Um, to me, whoever wins the presidency under either the Republican or the Democrat Party is really uh, it's in anything new. Um, I am concerned, but I have already seen what is that creates all the the challenges that we face, right? That we have in this country, uh, unfortunately, a very long history of discrimination against certain groups of people and, and against different social economic class group of people. So to me, regardless of who wins, uh, like the transgender community, especially undocumented community are going to be we like for many people this attack is completely new but we have already lived those sentiments that they're really spilling out publicly right so to me it's nothing surprising and 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 being being very proud of who i am making my own personal experience political and, and just sharing and challenging all these attacks is what they don't want Right, because me being undocumented transgender woman, I'm supposed to need, for many people, I'm not even supposed to be here. What is she doing here? Why hasn't she been deported? Because, right, and, and, and this is kind of a, the mentality, but like if you are living in a nation that highly values uh, the, the, the dignity and human rights of people, then um, we all should have a say, regardless we're able to go or not. And I think that's that's what really shaken up some of these uh, political parties here in this nation. That when you have a group of community raising their voices and really mobilizing and having some say in in shifting the direction of the country or, or the power dynamics, is that's why they feel like this threat, and that's why they feel it's the right way to come up with this very anti-immigrant, anti um, all kinds of sentiments. So. Um, I, um, I'm just fortunate to to know that I have, even though the opposition is strong, I'm also fortunate to know that we are as a community who is strong, who are resilient, who have really, politically speaking, have dealt with so much pain and we still have endured and we still continue to 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 resist and, 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 and fight back. Yes, of course. And, and uh, touching on the undocumented issue, um, even with the visibility that you have as an activist, 
are you personally afraid that there will be a point in time where they come for you or or have you been detained in the past? Have you already had that experience? Um, I have not. Um, I, I'm not afraid anymore. I used to be afraid, but I think I'm concerned at this point. I think for years I carry so much pain, so much fear, so much uh, shame of being transgender, of being undocumented, that I really lived on a thin line of being afraid that I could come at any time and, and, and put me in an immigration detention facilities because, you know, so I can start challenging the deportation process and things like that. But I, honestly, now I can say that once I got out of my comfort zone, I really spoke to to power and challenge one of the most powerful men in the world. It kind of broke me away from all this fear, from all these um, things that were holding me back from really trying to find my inner strength and my voice. And now that I've done that, I want other people in my community to find theirs. I don't want them to be living in fear yeah. that, and that's happening. Why would the immigration rate, people are, officials are going to homes, especially in the South, you know, would look at uh, Atlanta, North Carolina, and things like that, like having really early rates, immigration rates, and really putting people on the edge and, and, and living in so much Fear and afraid. Many of us are afraid to, you know, get out of the da- out of the house. Excuse me. So um, this is something that I know it's it's uh, it's really a challenging. But I will continue to raise my voice. I will continue to do what I can with it, within my capacity, within my strength, and, and and say, you know, we have every right to be here. We have every right to exist, and we have every right every right to raise our voices. Now, I want to ask you about, uh, and this is just, you know, calling for your general ideas, because obviously solving the undocumented immigration issue in this country is beyond complicated. It's something that's been tried for years. But I know that during the Obama presidency in recent years, he enacted some executive orders basically trying to reach the estimated 10 million or more undocumented people and said, I remember him saying, you can come out of the shadows now, you can get documented and start paying taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So that was his attempt to reach out to everyone and say, you can come out of the darkness and out of the shadows. But I didn't really see it happen. Um, Was that too soft? Was that not the message that those hiding in the shadows were waiting for? What do you think would be a message that people really hiding in fear uh, would, what would it take to get them to sign up and start putting their name to paperwork? Um, what happened with President Obama and, and his presidency and the administration when he ran for the presidency, right, um, almost eight years ago, he promised, he ran on the platform that he was going to do an immigration reform that was going to benefit many people and get people out of the shadows and, and, and they don't have to be living in fear or being afraid of being pulled over by the police or immigration and customs enforcement. That's ICE. So um, it, it's really, it's really unfortunate that the immigration narrative really divides our community. Because on the one hand, you have like the path to citizenship is those who have been here in this country don't have any criminal record. But there's a lot of restriction that excludes many people, including many um, LGBTQ community um, people, right? So um, to me, we really need to go beyond a reform and say, you know, we have, uh, what many people don't know when they say like they don't pay taxes, then uh, I challenge people to look at the IT numbers, right? The government, the federal government provides alternative numbers that it's assigned to people so you can do your taxes however ways you're working and bringing money to your homes, right? So every year, many undocumented people do their taxes with a specific number assigned by the federal government, the IRS, that will give you the the, the opportunity to claim your taxes and, and, and things like that. So the government knows how many people are doing here and, and, and what they're doing when it comes to that. So um, I will challenge people that notion that that say that we don't pay taxes because we do, and um, it just um, to me having the, the, the looking at, at the way that how we're going to approach this issue and how we're going to solve it, it really needs to be 
to have conversations with those most impacted, those who who are part of the LGBT community, those who are you know have a criminal record, whether you're part of the community or not. Because when we look 